Welcome back to the electronics inside. The show where we tear down tools, toys and appliances just to find out what's inside. I'm David and I need to do some maintenance on a few bits of kit. And of course, I thought there's no point in taking it apart if I can't share it with you. So here's my rendering machine. Okay, so this big flat lump of metal in front of me is a computer. It is the computer I use to render my videos and I'll go into detail as to why I chose this and why I use this a little bit later. But in terms of what you need to know, it's a 1U 19 inch rack mount server. Or was, it was retired from commercial life and I managed to pick it up reasonably cheap. But like anything, it needs a little bit of maintenance, a little bit of love, a service, a clean, and two of the sticks of RAM aren't reporting right to the motherboard. So we'll probably whip everything out, give it a clean, isopropyl alcohol contacts on the pads. Hopefully that'll make it work better. Let's get inside. Now the good news is commercial machines tend to be very friendly and easy to repair. Ta-da, no tools required. Of course, it's not really as simple as that, but it's a start. So the question is, where do I start with the specializations? Maybe I should explain by what rack mounts means. So at some point, especially in the electronics industry, most people will have come across a 19 inch rack mount equipment or 19 inch chassis mount equipment. And that started around the 19, 1900s, the teens, the 1920s. Um, when telecoms started being introduced and it made sense for very high density equipment to be rackable so you could stack stuff on top of each other and get high densities. Now about 1922 that standardized to 19 inch rails, two vertical 19 inch rails which stuff could bolt into. And there was some refinement but 19 inch has become sort of the de facto standard and the height of the equipment and how much space it takes up in that rack has been standardized into what are called U's or rack mount units, normally just referred to as U. And a 44.7 more inch and three quarter or whatever it is, is one U. And typical racks, you'll get them anywhere from six U, 12 U for wall mount cabinets that have just got a switch and a few network patch panels in them up to 42U floor mounting equipment, which take meter long or even 1200 millimeter long servers. And again, we'll go into some of the specializations when we're talking about the kit, but that gives you an idea of what some of those high density flashing cabinets are that often get used in Hollywood films. That's rack mount computing equipment. And that will apply for servers, um, switches, network appliances, of course you can get electronics, you can get a rack mount scope. I've got a scope and a 19 inch rack mount kit in outside. Audio equipment also, uh, anybody that's worked in entertainment or theater will probably have seen music production equipment that comes in 19 inch form factors. And as a result, it's stuck. And that's just the size and shape you can buy servers in now. But of course the physical form factor for high density computing doesn't just affect the size of it, there's also specializations which make this server useful for high uptime environments. And that starts at the back with the power supply. Or oh, more importantly, the two power supplies. So these power supplies have got board edge connectors, very high power 12 volt buses. So you can see all of the 12 volt and the grounds parallel together. And there's two of them and these are hot swappable. So if one of these failed in rack, you don't have to power down this server. You can swap this out with another one and keep the server running. For high uptime environments, that's very important. And these are 400 watt power supplies, 460 watt. Now that doesn't mean this machine will draw 800 and 920 watts. That means that it will run 460 watts from either power supply. When it's running nominally with both good power supplies, it'll actually draw half that from each. So also high uptime environment, 
hot swappable hard drives. So here are some of the hard drives that came in this machine. I wouldn't have chosen these for the application I use it for, but it's what came in it and I wasn't being fussy. These are 10K SAS, which means the platters spin at 10,000 RPM, serial attached SCSI. So although these are compatible with serial ATA 2 and 3, they are actually a different specification that is a serial attached SCSI. And both these discs are 146 gigabyte. Now, most servers of this class, this quality, will run what's called RAID, a redundant array of inexpensive discs. Normally that's done for high performance and high resilience. So you will often see servers and storage appliances with lots and lots of discs in them that are designed so that if one fails, again, you can take a physical disc out, put a replacement in, and it will rebuild its integrity, data integrity without loss of uptime. You don't even have to shut the machine down to do that. On this particular machine, I'm more interested in performance because I don't have mission critical data stored on these two disks. So I have these run in RAID 0, RAID 0, striping. So one bit of data gets written across both disks. And as you're doing that, you can use the bandwidth available by both of the connections. So if this was six gigabyte serial ATA, for example, just because it's got a nice easy number to work with, and I was doing striping across two six gigabyte drives, the theory goes I could write at 12 gigabytes a second across that storage array. It doesn't always work out practically like that, depending on bandwidth limitations in the controller versus the hard drives versus the type of file and the, the all kinds of things. But in principle, I'm running this in a single 100, 300 gig storage array designed for speed, but it's still not as good as a, as uh, solid state storage. It's something I might upgrade at some point. So also you will notice a huge array of fans at the front and heat sinks with no fans on the motherboard. And again, that's a very deliberate thing because if you've got a rack full of computers and IT hardware from different manufacturers and different purposes, you want consistent cold air coming in one side and the hot air that comes out the back, which can be very warm, discharging in the same direction. And computing, so network switches and servers, will almost invariably suck the cold air in the front and eject the hot air out the back. Now that leads to some interesting physical layouts of equipment rooms, uh, to name a few, cold and hot aisle containment. Um, but what it does is it stops the hot air from one server being sucked in the back of another appliance and making an appliance overheat. So typically, computing rack mount equipment, you will find that's always front to back cooling, most of the time. See again, toolless removal. I've not used a screwdriver so far, and there are instructions on how to take everything apart on every part. Oh look, the only screwdriver I might need is actually in here. That's a nice touch. Well done, HP. Oh, uh, just in case it wasn't really obvious, this thing is heavy. It's 40 something mil long, 19 inches wide, weighs a lot. It's very dense. Please remember this is for IT heavy environments. So imagine this is gonna be in a server room with a hundred other computers. Keeping this quiet is not even a consideration. So having a 40 millimeter wind tunnel style fans screaming away is not unexpected. In fact, there are many, many server rooms and equipment dense rooms that would require hearing protection before you enter. So from here, we have a power supply, which runs to this miniature PCB at the front. Now that actually runs to a breakout board, which gives power to each of the hard drive bays along here. So like I said, you could have up to four hard drives, two and a half inch hard drives in the front. And there's also a DVD drive and a couple of additional ports at the front. Memory. Memory is actually the main reason for me doing this as a teardown, because I can't remember which ones. I think it was eight, Socket 8 was not reporting properly. I can't even see the labels yet. Either way, they're all going to come out. So even this memory is not normal memory. This will be called ECC or error correcting memory. So this is largely reserved for servers and high criticality applications where 
The memory has its own checksums and is self-correcting, error-correcting, which has a tiny impact on the performance of speed. But if you're handling big transactions for banking and things like that, you can't make mistakes. You can't have one bit dropped. It doesn't matter if you're going to lose a frame out of your game, but if you're going to lose 100 banking transactions, it's an issue. So you have ECC memory, error-correcting memory. I've just realized that there's actually a stick missing. I've only got five sticks of RAM there. That does explain a lot. Now under here, I have a pair of Xeons, a pair of server grade Xeons. Now these don't have your normal energy saving issues. They don't have any throttling to save electricity. They don't have battery life considerations. They don't have uh, a lower thermal setting to reduce fan speed. These things will basically run all out all the time that they are on which again, it's noise and waste electricity to a degree, but servers are all about performance. It doesn't matter. There we go. They are the PCIe risers. You see there's a four speed and a 16 speed PCIe bus. And this network card actually is on the daughter board for the 16 speed lane. And that offers four one gigabyte ethernet ports, which like I say, I think was used as a nice guzzy target. Oh, one thing I haven't mentioned is rails. Um, a lot of rack mount equipment, because you imagine this is in a rack with stuff directly on top of it. You're obviously not getting in the top of this easily. So these come with rails and I've got sort of half the rail assembly on this server. Which actually I don't use, so I have no idea why they're still on there. But these rails would then slide into like a, a drawer, like a drawer has the sliders on the side. So when this is in a rack packed in against other components, if you wanted to get in the top and access the RAM or do an upgrade like that, you don't have to take it out and take it away. You would have uh, the ability to slide this out of the rack and sticks out the front while you maintain it. To do that, like I said, this is heavy and it sort of cantilever out. The, the rails that fit into the rack would actually be mounted on four posts, so two at the front and two at the back. And that would allow this to really be rigidly fixed. And there's a couple of thumb screws on the front of the fascia don't actually fix, in, fix into the rack directly, they would fix into the front of the rails. Do I think I need to take the heat sinks off for the Xeons and check the thermal paste? Yeah, really glad I did actually. <laughs> so as I said, these these heat sinks don't have their own fans because all of the air is moving through this case front to back uniformly, probably very close to laminar airflow. The only component that's got its own heat uh, fans are the, um, are the PSUs. And that's because they will actually be generating sort of the five volt, three volt and 12 volt buses, even when the rest of the machine is off. That is brings me nicely round to why I actually wanted to use rack mount servers for my rendering machine. First of all, I knew I could get an old rack mount server, high power, high energy CPUs, uh, a lot of RAM, very cheap. This has probably been ripped out of a commercial environment that was using it for virtualization. So for me running Windows on it with uh, a, a video rendering piece of software, it should chew through it. And the best thing is this is fire and forget. This is tucked away in a cupboard. This is the first time I've had physical contact with it probably since I started using it two years ago. And that's down to out of bounds management. So the only connectors I use on this server are the two power supplies, the two network connections. Out of bounds management allows you to take complete control of power, cycling, low level diagnostics, of the computer remotely, in most cases through a web interface, although a lot of them will use an app if you have a newer one. So this means that I can have the out of bounds management plugged into a network port and I can have the computer plugged into a network port, which it will re recognize. And when I need this turned on, I can connect to it from my laptop, from my phone, ask its power on. And when it's powered on, I can log into Windows using remote desktop. There's no need for me to sit down with a mouse and keyboard plugged into this computer ever. Not even when I did the installation. You can actually plug a USB flash drive in the front of this and install from there. 
to a certain degree, you can even do that over the web interface to the Out of Bounds Management card. Now, HP call their Out of Bounds Management Suite ILO, Integrated Lights Out. Uh, Dell call it iDRAC. Um, other computer manufacturers call it different things, but Out of Bounds Management, as far as I can tell, is the generic way of describing it. And for a machine that is doing nothing but being a workhorse rendering videos with network access that I don't have to see, don't have to give space to to my house, I don't have to have a desk with a dedicated monitor and keyboard, it's fantastic for me. Now the one thing I wasn't expecting to see, and I have no idea why it is here, is why there's a single USB port and an SD card on the motherboard. Now I could imagine that that might be for firmware updates that you can't do through the operating system because people may be running exotic or virtualized operating systems on here, which means you may not have a convenient client to download and install from. So it could be for hardware update grades, but the SD card is a strange inclusion. And I wonder if actually that's that serves another purpose. Again, the only way I'm going to find that out is by digging out the manual and looking that up. So I know this wasn't the normal format video where we just get something and take it apart just to see what's in there, but I thought if I've got to take something apart for a bit of maintenance anyway, I may as well bring you guys along for the journey. If you've enjoyed this and are happy for me to do another one just like this, let me know over in the Element 14 community at element14.com forward slash the electronics inside. Thank you for joining me for this weird video. I'll see you on the next one.